बी टीवी जस्ट बी to you in Jesus' name. I'm happy to be with you this morning. I pray that uh, this finds you doing well. Jairus Mutebe is my name and uh, I work with uh, the Deliverance Church Uganda as one of the leaders and I uh, also work with an organization called Development Associates International. We've been pursuing this week uh, our faith series and today we want to look at the five keys of successful living. Five keys of successful living. We are going to use Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 19, to help us understand these five keys. And each of those verses is going to bring out one of those keys. Verse 15 says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. Five things in there. And the first one is purpose. What is purpose? We know those, that definition from our leadership studies. And when we are writing a vision, a mission, purpose basically means the reason why something was created. The reason why something was created. God never made anything as a spare. He makes original and it has its purpose. The verse 15 talks about it, that God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and care for it, to work it, to tend and care for it. God has given us a work of tending and caring for this earth. Purpose is a glimpse of your end, what God has called you to do. And unfortunately, the average person only achieves a small percentage of their potential. I wonder how much of your potential you've been able to achieve. Most people don't even know why they exist. If you find somebody who just spends his time drinking and shouting on the village, you just realize a purposeless person. Somebody who is reckless with, with his life, rides a board and tries to show off. There are people who do not seem to have a purpose. They are, it is hidden from them. In the Bible, we had people like Joseph. They knew their purpose. And because they knew their purpose, they did not try to mess their lives up. As a teenager, don't think I'm young. I need to grow up, then I begin to behave myself. No, 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 no. David and Joseph we are 17 year olds, very young, when they began to enter into their purposes. Miles Monroe says the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but living life without a purpose. When we live life without a purpose, that's the greatest tragedy in life. It's amazing that almost all people 
who made important scientific inventions were deeply committed Christians. Because it's in the Bible that you find your purpose. It is in, the, in being a Christian that you find your significance. And as you read the Bible, you begin to see according to your calling and purpose. You begin to find answers right in there. Right in there. Most of the inventors who were Christians, you know, we are inspired by scripture. Dr. Steve Ogan writes in his book, uh, Can Fly Like Eagles. We can fly like, you can fly like the eagles. He traces some of the men in there who lived on purpose and uh, discovered very, very interesting things. One of them is Copernicus. We read about this person in our schools. Copernicus was an, a Polish astronomer and discovered that the earth revolves around the sun in a circular orbit and rotates on its axis. It goes around the sun like this, but it's rotating also around its axis. And uh, it was discovered in the time when people thought the earth was flat and was motionless. He didn't even know how the sun was you know, rising up and setting in the evening. But you know where Copernicus read it? He read it in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 40, 22. Isaiah 40, verse 22, which says, you sit on the sack of the earth, and the human beings are like grasshoppers. You know? So the Bible talked about the sack. And then this philosopher, this uh, astronomer, who was looking through those, uh, what are they called? those telescopes, he began to realize, my God, there's a connection between what the Bible is saying in verse 22 and what the earth is. He was actually a church of England canon. He was a canon in the church. Another inventor was Blaise Pascal, a French scientist who discovered the first mathematical adding machine, which became the precursor to the computer. This, this man was a, a man of God. And he, he said, he's the one who invented this saying that man has a vacuum that only God can fill. They lived according to their purpose. Other people that were very impacting on our society are the Wright brothers who lived in the 1800s, 1867 to 1912. Another lived 1881, 1881 to 1948. The Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orville, they are the ones who invented the plane, the airplane. And uh, you can remember, the, some of you have seen some of those pictures of the airplane uh, without doors and so on, and the thing is flying. Where did they find it? Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 8 which asks a question, who are these who come flying? Isaiah was seeing people coming flying, people, not birds, people flying like birds to their nests like doves. It was in Isaiah 60 and verse 8. So this inspired these men. Uh, another one that we all know very well about is Thomas Edison. He lived about the same period as the Wright brothers, 1847 to 1931. He was a committed Christian. He invented many things, including the phonograph. Phono means sound, and the graph means a machine. So he invented the phonograph, which was also uh, became a gramophone, and he also invented the light bulb. He held 1,093 patents to his name. Yeah. This man, on his deathbed, <clears throat> confessed as he was dying, it is very beautiful up there. My God, if a scientist can say it is beautiful up there, he was seeing heaven. He was a scientist, 1,093 patents, but he was seeing heaven. 
And if he's a scientist, if he can say it is beautiful up there, then you know that it is true. There were others like uh, James Young, an obstetrician, who discovered the properties in chloroform for putting people to sleep. I like this one a lot. I always use him as an illustration. Where did he read it from? From this, the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, verse 21. People were being operated alive when they were seeing and they would die of the pain of the surgery before they could die even of the disease. So this man was wondering, how do we stop pain? How do we put people so they don't feel the pain? So he discovered as he read Genesis 2.21 how God put Adam to sleep. Then he opened him up, removed the rib, closed up the place before he, he woke up. And it was a very clear medical process. Put somebody to sleep, open the place, remove what you are removing or putting, putting in, close up the place, very medical process. And then he wakes the person up. Now, if somebody says the Bible is contradictory to science, they are dead wrong. Actually, science confirms the scriptures. The first three operations were carried out in 1847 using chloroform, which he had discovered. And we've had mighty people in this country. And incidentally, some of the prominent people that have changed this country have been women. We had our sister Jennifer Musisi. Uh, we can see the Wonder Gear market was like an ordinary market. There's now a powerful, you know, high rise building. Committed Christian. We now have our sister Dorothy Kisaka. She has begun already having imprint on the city. I know her. We thank God for such women. Alan Kajina transformed URA. It was the most, it was regarded as the most corrupt organization. At least, even if there wasn't anything to show for, the narrative changed. It was no longer the most corrupt but the least corrupt and became a showcase. People never wanted to employ anybody from that organization. But they began, they were now having problems. They could not keep their staff. They were leaving and going to other places. Of course, she retired on her own voluntarily, but again, the powers that be could not let her retire. They have employed her in another place. And we are seeing mighty things happening in UNRWA. Why? Because God can use you in your purpose. The second uh, thing that we notice there is the uh, provision. That's the second key. Uh, and uh, in the Genesis chapter 16, it says that uh, you may eat any fruit in the garden freely. That's a very powerful thing that God does not give us a purpose without provision. Where there is a vision, there is also provision. So the resources needed to fulfill my purpose. Scarcity does not, the word scarcity doesn't exist in the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 8 verse 9, it talks about a land where bread will not be scarce. The word scarce is used in a negative way, not be uh, scarce, and you lack nothing. Hmm? A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. I am telling you, the richness on our continent blows our minds. Can you realize that the, the tantalite or cobalt or whatever is being used in the phones, in your mobile phones, in the smartphones, they are mined in Congo, right there. Who oh, has put it? It is God. You know, somebody says that if it is God's will, it is his bill. The blessings in Africa are in many areas, but specifically four areas, in our natural resources. Also in our historical contribution 
to God's unfolding redemptive plan. You know, we don't hear of Jesus Christ going to Asia as a baby. He came to where? To Africa. We don't hear him going to America. He came to Africa. Abraham, Africa. You know, all these powerful people, Africa. Israel was incubated, incubated for 400 years on the continent of Africa. So the historical contribution to God's unfolding redemptive plan was here in Africa. So Africa is blessed. The richness of our people, the variety of our culture, the richness of it. Uh, the incredible, the fourth one is the incredible growth of the church across the continent during the last century. While in other places the church has been becoming smaller, here it has been increasing. It might be a mile wider than an inch th uh, thin, but we are making that inch th uh, thicker. It's getting deeper as we have been doing discipleship. One of the actors called Will Smith, when he visited Africa for the first time, he's an African-American, he made a very powerful statement. He says it feels like God visits everywhere else, but he lives in Africa. We have 9 million square kilometers or miles of solar energy potential right here on this continent. Everywhere you direct your solar panel, you'll get solar. You'll get, elect, you'll get uh, energy. In other places, if they're in the, the northern hemisphere, they have to direct their solar panels south. If they're southern hemisphere, they have to direct their solar panels in the north. Here, any direction, you get energy. Man, we should be able to celebrate that. Three, prohibition. We saw purpose. We saw provision. The third thing is Prohibition. Prohibition, things that must not be done so that our purpose is not aborted. In verse 17, it says, Accept fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of its fruit, you will surely die. There are things God has told us not to do. Brothers and sisters, if you are going to prosper, we need to know what not to do. Character is what protects your gift. Character is what protects your purpose. Your charisma is protected by your character. Individual character affects everyone. Don't just say, it's my business. None of your business. It is my business if there is no character in the village. Remember Cain? When Cain messed up, the whole Israel was, could not continue until that was removed from the, the amid chapter 7 of Joshua. It is more important to be faithful than to be famous. History has men and women who mess themselves up and are affected not only themselves but also their people. Napoleon Bonaparte, or Bonaparte, a great French emperor, was very, very powerful. He was invincible. Why? Because he was faithful to his wife, Josephine. But in 1798, when he put her aside, he began to decline. He began to decline. Huh? And he died after Waterloo, defeat in 1815, while living with a mistress, Albine Montholon. Montholon. Character brought him down. He was an invincible commander. Let's watch the kind of prohibitions that God is putting on everything that is given us. Every gift has a thing that we shouldn't do. Every purpose has a proviso of things that you shouldn't do. Number four, people. People. People you feel free to work with. We don't, we're not going to work with everybody. But the person that you feel, you feel free to work with, because they have a similar purpose, because there's a chemistry. 
that person God has given it to you, has given that person to you. And verse 18 says, And the Lord said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a companion who will help him. We use this scripture mostly for man and wife who are going to get married. But it's more than that. Hmm? You cannot be successful without people. It is difficult. But then you need to know whom you choose to be your company. Keep company with people who have a dream and will encourage you. You need to evaluate whoever is around you. If somebody does not bless you, if somebody pulls you down, remove them from your list. Somebody has said that evaluate the people in your life, then promote, demote, or delete, or terminate. You know? Why? Because you are the owner of your life. Don't just die at the mercy of other people. No. Choose the right kind of people to work with. Hallelujah. Number five, participation. Participation. Number one was purpose. Number two was provision. Number three was prohibition. Number uh, four was people. And number five is participation. What kind of participation are we talking about here? Uh, verse 19 says, So the Lord God formed from the soil every kind of animal and bird. He brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. I like the next phrase. And Adam chose a name for each one. Whatever name he gave them, that was its name. Whatever name you, you call them. He, Adam, uh, he, he, he came to Adam, he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. He, and that's a very, very powerful thing. He called a dog a dog, and it, was a, it became a dog. He, and uh, it, you know, it behaved like a dog. He, whatever name he gave them, it controlled their behavior. So whatever name we have chosen for a circumstance, that becomes its name. So what does participation mean? The need for involvement of man and, the, and, and God. God and man. God did his part. He created from the soil. And then he gave the man to determine what that thing should be. So you can choose to tell me that uh, all this God has given me in Uganda, there is only misery. So if, with our mouth, with our tongue, we form, we create. The Bible says the tongue has power to give life and death. Uh, Proverbs 18, either 21 or 22. The tongue has power to give life and death. You can decide that there will be life here. So there will be life there. Or you can decide there will be death there. You know, somebody gave an illustration of two grasshoppers which fell in the milk. One of the grasshoppers said, I am drowning, I can't survive, I am dead. And indeed it drowned in the, in the milk and died. Another grasshopper said, no, 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 I am not going to drown. So it flapped its wings a thousand um, you know, times per second. And the milk got churned with, as it flapped its wings. And when it got churned, it became solid. And the grasshopper left. So you determine the circumstances by what you are saying. And what you do. Words create. They also do what? They also destroy. So what is my participation with God? What God has created and has brought to me to name it. I name it something that it should be. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 2 says, If you have been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth. Sometimes we trap ourselves by what we are saying. We ensnare ourselves by the words of our mouth. That's Proverbs 6 verse 2. May God help us that we don't trap ourselves by the things we are saying. In Matthew 12, verse 36 to 37, 
it says, let me tell you something. Every one of these careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation or words can also be your damnation. Very, very important. Every one of the words that we are carelessly speaking, they will come to be uh, our damnation. They will come back to haunt us. Let us use good words. You know, there are moments I've spoken certain things and I regret that I spoke them up. But, you know, as Basoga said, Owemuka echiva ya otawemuike chivono. You would rather be, they, they, they would rather see your naked body than see your naked heart. A naked heart is very dangerous. Dr. Miles Munro also says that it is easier to cast out devils than to see a person transformed in their mindset. If a mindset is already spoiled, it will take a long, long time for it to be transformed. That's why we need discipleship. Discipleship helps us to be transformed, to be altered, to alter our worldview. Uh, if somebody says that when there's a problem in Africa, we just compose songs to explain it. Other countries where their mindsets are different, they are struggling to find a solution. They're trying to find a cure. Thank God that that is changing now, that we can find solutions by our own selves. So participation is a key thing. Let's pray. If you're not saved and you want God to change you so that you live a purposeful life, you live a life of where you are provided for, you know what not to do, you know the put work with, and you know how to participate, and you want to give your life to Christ, just say this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for me. I thank you that you love me. And you came specifically for me. I ask you to forgive me all my sins. I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for those men and women who have listened to me and have also given their lives to you for the first time or they have renewed their lives. Lord, may you minister to them, O oh God. May you receive them. Delete their name from the book of life, death and destruction, and write their names in the book of life. Thank you, Jesus. Pray for all the others that have listened, and Lord, they need to make a move in establishing themselves in their purposes and partnerships and people. Lord, I cry to you that they will be able to see the provision. Their eyes will see and will move, not waste their life on this planet. Thank you, Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now on the screen, we have the numbers of our telephone numbers just rolling uh, below there. If you need prayer, just call us. We can pray with you. If you need counseling, we can talk with you. If you, need, you have any question, feel free. The numbers are right there on the, sc on the screen at the bottom. Just talk to us. God bless you very much. Thank you for listening to me. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>